Welcome to the show, Dr. Shabir. Pleasure to be on. So we're talking about the, uh, you know, the racist outbursts in Toronto and Canada. So just based on what you've seen, do you feel like hate crimes are on the rise in Toronto and Canada at large? Yes, yeah, so certainly. It's something that I feel personally, and uh, it, it is uh, also um, uh, something that we know from the number of incidents that we've been witnessing recently uh, across the GTA and even across Canada. Many of these incidents have been documented by NCCM, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and um, uh, also uh, th there are many reports which uh, are seen from CBC and many reputable uh, out news outlets uh, showing that uh, incidents one after another of a very serious nature uh, reflect this rise. So obviously there are a lot, but we're focusing on the most recent one, uh, where a 50-year-old uh, white man hurled, uh, you know, racist insults at a at a family. He was he has since then been charged. So just looking at this from an Islamic perspective, what does Islam say about sort of racism and and you know targeting people for their differences? Well, definitely Islam teaches us to welcome people of all races. Uh, the Quran itself that tells us in the 49th chapter, in the 11th verse, that God created us uh, from a male and female and made us into na nations and tribes so that we may recognize each other and uh, the flip side of that is obviously that we should not uh, despise each other and the Quran says do not look down on people in the same surah in the same chapter uh, because the one you're looking down on may be better than you in the sight of God and of course uh, according to that surah those who are best in the sight of God are those who are more conscious of their relationship with God. Uh, so we are not to look down on any race and we to treat everyone as uh, equals. They're all uh, children of, of Adam. And uh, we recognize that uh, ev even the person of any color can be our leader and we stand side by side in our prayers uh, with persons of all color. We, uh, of all colors, we, we circumambulate the Kaaba, this most sacred house of uh, worship in the Islamic faith. Um, all together, side by side, without any discrimination between white or black or um, whatever color. So that, fr from that perspective, you're talking about racism within our Muslim community, but what about racism? Because in this situation, it was pretty much a white man um, targeting a, a Muslim family. So what about um, racism from like different religions, Muslim versus Christian, Muslim versus like, what is this from that perspective as well? What does Islam say about racism through that context? Um, well, the, the, the teachings of Islam are so broad here that we can uh, advise anyone uh, to adopt these teachings. It's not necessarily a teaching from within Islam alone. Mm -hmm. we, we know that there is a basic humanity uh, that is there in all of us, regardless of religion, whether we are Muslim, Jew, Christian, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, or whatever. We recognize that the other person is just like us, uh, flesh and blood, uh, you know, we bleed uh, the same color. Uh, as uh, Sidney Poitier uh, was made to point out in his acting role in, 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 the, in the movie, um, uh, To Sir With Love, I believe the name of that movie was. Very old movie, mm -hmm. maybe m many of our viewers haven't seen that. You know, <laughs> only a person with a white beard <laughs> like mine would <laughs> recall such a movie. But uh, yeah, I mean, here he was as a teacher in a classroom uh, of white students and uh, uh, they, you know, they, uh, when, when he w was cut and, and he bled, that's when, you know, that uh, surprised uh, one of his students. Uh, because what did they expect to see? They never thought about that. But here is a man uh, of, of dark sk uh, skin, but he bleeds the same as the rest of us. Uh, so we, we recognize that basic humanity and we can only appeal to our Canadian uh, uh, folks in, in general. Uh, to let this uh, racism thing go and uh, you know we have to recognize our cultural baggages of our history and uh, whatever biases and, and bigotry and so on has been may have been ingrained in some of us from childhood or from our past experiences those all have to go we have to embrace uh, humanity as a whole now there were um, thank you for that there were uh, the family talked about uh, how you know there were a lot of people watching and they wish that uh, other people would step in and, and do something or support them. Um, now, I was watching an interview, I think it was by City TV News, where they actually interviewed a lawyer and they said, from a legal perspective, obviously there's no obligation. But what about looking at this from a moral and a religious perspective in terms of the role of a bystander? From a religious and moral perspective, does the bystander have any role, if any? And, and if so, then what is that role? In our faith, we are taught to, um, to do something uh, as much as you are able. 
Uh, so th there's a hadith says, uh, that, that says whoever sees something uh, being done wrong uh, should intervene to stop it, either by, uh, by force, if he has the ability to uh, do that, or uh, if he doesn't, then at least speaking out against it, uh, and if not, then at least uh, to hate it with one's heart, but uh, that, that's the lowest of, of faith. Um, so what can be done in that situation? One has to see how much ability one has. If you have the physical ability to stop it, well then th that's the work of police. They have the physical ability. Sometimes if the police are not present, there are some people who are on hand and they have the ability to stop what's going on. They should intervene. But of course they have to weigh the circumstances and ask themselves, do they truly have the ability? Or might they, in their attempts to stop what's going wrong, uh, cause more harm? Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they have to think about that uh, in the end, maybe harm to themselves, not so much to themselves, but to even to people around them and so on. So if you're trying to stop bloodshed, might you by intervening cause more bloodshed? That, that's the biggest, uh, the bigger question there. Uh, but at least people can speak and uh, often it so happens that uh, nobody even speaks. People are just simply so, you know, mind my, my own business type of thing. A in a way, that's, uh, that's, that's a good part of Canadian culture that we mind our own business. We leave other people to mind, you know, to have their own privacy and so on. But there are times when definitely we need to intervene and say something at least uh, in order to uh, stop what the wh whatever wrong is uh, mm -hmm. happening around us. And uh, sometimes it so happens that uh, people are, are beaten and uh, no, nobody intervenes. In this uh, particular case at the uh, uh, Toronto Island Ferry uh, Terminal, um, uh, no, it didn't come to that. No, nobody was beaten, thank God. But uh, there are other cases where people are, in fact, uh, beaten. There was a case in Mississauga recently mm -hmm. where a man coming back from a picnic with his family uh, was attacked uh, by two others and, and beaten senseless. He, he has suffered from b brain hemorrhaging and uh, is still in the hospital. So this uh, is uh, a, 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 a real case of uh, of um, uh, bigotry and, and racism and um, perhaps even what we have here is a hate crime and, and police have to look at it from that perspective. Um, and, and they have begun to, look at, uh, begun to look at it from that perspective because it is said that the persons who attack this uh, man uh, spoke about his country of origin. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, you know, this classifies, uh, according to one definition, as a hate crime. So uh, in a situation like that, somebody is being beaten senseless, definitely you have to intervene. And uh, there is something known as a citizen's arrest. Uh, if a citizen of this country can actually arrest uh, a person uh, until police come uh, to the scene to take over, if that becomes necessary. Mm -hmm. And I think even in that, the other situation, um, as Washington City News, the lawyer was saying, even if you're afraid for your life or whatever the case may be, you can, it's something as simple as the Toronto uh, ferry incident. It's something as simple as just standing, standing with them sort of a show of solidarity so it doesn't, you know, if you're fearful for your life. Obviously in a situation where someone's being beaten up, it's a different context, but there are other things that can be done. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm glad you added that. I wouldn't have thought of that before. And um, uh, the you asked about a moral perspective on this. Mm -hmm. You know, we as moral human beings, whether Muslim or, or otherwise, uh, at the end of the day, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror, or maybe next morning as we're going to brush our teeth or something. Uh, so what do we see in the mirror? What do we want to see? Like, who are we as individuals? Are we people who just stand by and let other people be beaten up and abused, uh, even verbally? Uh, or are, are we going to intervene and stand up for what is right? The Quran tells us very clearly, uh, all you who believe, stand up for justice. And uh, that is the Muslim principle, and I believe that this is the principle of uh, many people as well. Um, you know, you talked about the other incident in the Mississauga man where he was also beaten, and it's being investigated as a hate crime. So, um, you know, you can't help but feel that, and even the incident yesterday, uh, sorry, not yesterday, but with the Toronto t a terminal, you can't help but feel that Muslims are being targeted. Um, so how should, um, as a Muslim community, how should we handle this? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to speak more broadly as Canadians. So we, we Canadians have to ask what's happening to our country. I came to this country uh, in 1978. How many years is that? Some uh, almost uh, 40 many, many years. years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, w when I first came to uh, Toronto, it was not like this. People were more welcoming. And uh, now I feel that there is some tension. There is a lot of... Um, 
uh, suspicion and uh, tension really between the Muslims uh, and, and others that, that's on the rise. And, and we need to curb this. Uh, we, we cannot have a situation where a person like myself, sometimes I wonder uh, twice before uh, going to, uh, like if I have to choose between driving and using the subway. And there was a time when uh, I would have preferred to uh, ride on the subway because uh, I would use the time to read. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now there's uh, often a time when I would just uh, choose to ride instead of, or to, to, drive to drive instead yeah. of riding the subway because uh, I don't know if I'll be subjected to undue danger by by riding the subway so if this is what is happening now we as Canadians have to ask ourselves like what has changed in, in our country and is it changing for the better or are we supposed to maintain our openness to multiculturalism and welcome people of all different uh, shades and, and stripes. As, as Muslims, definitely we need to, on the one hand, uh, practice caution, um, not to put ourselves to undue risk and, and danger, uh, but at the same time, we cannot uh, limit our freedom uh, due to uh, unwarranted fear. We have to tread a line between uh, complacency and uh, and, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, being paranoid. So between paranoia and complacency, we need to walk a, a, f a fine line in between, um, enjoying the freedoms uh, that uh, we are accustomed to in this country, but at the same time, uh, be a little bit cautious so that uh, we do not overexpose ourselves to danger. And uh, in, in addition to this, uh, I would uh, impose on Muslims uh, the obligation uh, to convey the message of our faith uh, to people around us so that they can understand what our faith is about, what our noble teachings are, and who we are as individuals and the citizens of this great country. Now, just as we wrap up, um, you know, from a, how do you de address this from a child's perspective? Because even the two incidents that we're talking about, the Toronto Ferry Terminal and even the one where the Mississauga man was beaten, there were children who were witnessing this. So how do you um, sort of, like, what do we teach our kids? We, we have to teach them to uh, tolerance on the one hand uh, because that this, these kinds of incidents uh, come from intolerance and racism and bigotry and we don't want the same thing to come from us to harm other people. Uh, just as we don't want others to harm us, we don't want to harm other people as well. So we need to teach the noble principles to begin with. Second, we need to teach our children uh, patience in, this, in the uh, face of this kind of uh, bigotry and racism. Um, uh, we, we need to teach them that uh, this is the way of the prophets and those who were servants of God uh, described in, in the Quran, uh, whether they be talking about the prophet Noah uh, or a Abraham or Moses or even Jesus. So all of these people were uh, noble men, noble individuals. They were persecuted by their people simply because they stood up for the truth. Uh, we, in our small way, because we stand for a certain uh, teaching that has come from God, um, uh, we become the targets of abuse uh, from, from others. Well, we're, we're in that line uh, of the great uh, martyrs uh, of, of the past, so we just simply have to accept that uh, to a certain extent and pray to God uh, to bring about better times for, uh, for us. And, and at the same time, we need to teach our children that not all people are like this. Uh, while we experience this from uh, some people, the vast majority of people are not that. I remember speaking in a mosque uh, that was uh, largely populated by non-Muslims who mm -hmm. came to the mosque to express their sympathy uh, for, for Muslims. And uh, a little girl asked a question. <laughs> she was a, a, Muslim, a girl from a Muslim family, uh, probably only about uh, four years old. And she asked uh, Imam, uh, why do people hate us? <laughs> so um, I had to say to her, little girl, um, you see all of the people who are here? They, they don't hate us. Mm -hmm. they, they came because they, they want to show their sympathy uh, for us and their solidarity with us. And, and most people are like that. Yes, there are some people who out there who we have to be weary, uh, weary about, but uh, most of the people are quite supportive, quite loving and kind. Thank you very much, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. If you want more of Let the Quran Speak, you can watch previous episodes or new ones by subscribing to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Quran Speaks. Stay updated by liking us on Facebook and following us on Twitter at Quran underscore Speaks. And when you're on the go, listen to our podcast at QuranSpeaks.com.